that, I wanted to welcome Mark Evans. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm great. Thanks for having me again. Uh, I feel like I'm a regular guest, like I'm kind of on the Johnny Carson show and you keep inviting me back. So it's, uh, it's always good to talk marketing. And as we said off the top, there's a lot of things happening within the marketing landscape. Things had gone pretty quiet in you know, April, May, and June, but I'm personally seeing a lot of momentum these days and a lot of activity. Yeah, we might as well jump into it because uh, I noticed your next slide talks a little bit about you. So why don't we uh, tell the audience a little bit about who you are? Great. So what I'm a fractional CMO for B2B companies. And as it says, they're specialized in brand positioning and messaging, which is basically your story. Strategic planning, which is how and where to tell your story and tactical execution. Um, a lot of the companies I work with have no marketing departments or very small marketing departments. And they're looking for someone to essentially help them move forward, help them get unstuck. Uh, you can find out more information about what I do at marketingspark.co. I just launched a new resources section on the website with courses, free courses, um, videos, uh, some of the things I, I write about on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm a, I write every day there. So if you are you're looking for marketing insight, that's where you can find, uh, find some thoughts about what I think about marketing these days. Great. And I'm going to throw a link to that in the chat room um, as okay. soon as it just in a minute. Okay. Um, so we're talking today about, um, you know, creating a marketing strategy. So, you know, can you tell me what uh, a marketing strategy is? Well, let me get into the presentation and I'll. Okay. Perfect. Tell you what okay. So part of it, marketing strategy, I went forgot to mention, I wrote a book called Marketing Spark, which you can get on Amazon. And it really is uh, a do-it-yourself guide to marketing. It's prescriptive. There's, it's full of templates and worksheets and tools. And, and there's a big part of the book is about marketing strategy and what you need to know to put a roadmap together for success. Um, today's agenda, I'm going to co come across different areas. And it's, it's a bit of a flyby. Um, I'm not going to drill too deep into any particular section because that would be a long presentation and very multifaceted. But as Craig said, if you have questions, I'd encourage you to ask them during the presentation or afterwards, or that you can pay me directly uh, by email. Craig can put the email address into the chat. And what I want to do is give you a, a holistic view of how to create a marketing strategy. Some of the pillars that you need to think about so that when you are putting together a plan of attack, you've got all the key areas covered off. And I just wanted to mention, we were chatting beforehand that we wanted to give the users, uh, sorry, the attendees a heads up that we're going to do an exercise a little later. Yes, exactly. So to add a little bit of added value, what I want you to do right now is think about a marketing channel that you're using or that you're thinking about using. And what we're going to do later in the presentation is we're going to, I'm going to give you a, a um, a tool to formulate uh, whether it makes sense to leverage that channel. So it's a really simple tool that you can apply to your to the different marketing options. And to illustrate the utility of the tool, uh, just write down a channel right now, whether it's LinkedIn or a blog or webinars. And when we get to that section, I want, I'll ask you uh, to look at three different criteria and then you can you can uh, assess quickly whether it makes sense for your company. So a lot of what I've learned about marketing strategy comes from working with more than 100 B2B companies over the past 11 years. In my world, whales are the best clients. They're the ones that stick around for six to 12 months. They have big marketing budgets. They're looking to leverage marketing to drive growth and to scale. But what I found with so many of these whales is that the engagements aren't as successful as they want to be because they lack well-articulated strategic plans. They're like a lot of companies, and this applies to growing, scaling companies and small companies, is they're so excited about tactical execution. They're so focused on making things happen, writing blog posts, doing webinars, that they don't take the time to step back and think about what are we doing? Why do we want to do it? And how do we assess whether we are being successful? And that's a fundamental part of a marketing strategy is giving yourself a roadmap for success. And if you're not doing that, it doesn't matter how much money you have or how smart your people are, it's not going to be as successful as you want it to be. 
Um, so the question, uh, Craig, you asked uh, off the top is what is a marketing strategy? And there's different ways to look at it. And I call it a roadmap for success. Or um, as Vince Lombardi says, it's basically, it's, it's, it's realism versus hope. Um, Michael Porter, who is a very well-known economist, said the essence of strategy is choosing what not to do. And I think that's so relevant and so uh, um, powerful because many companies, including many startups, do everything. And they're, they explore so many different options. They spread themselves way too thin and they end up not being successful at anything. And so as much as you want to decide, okay, we're gonna focus on these channels, you also want to determine these are the channels that we're not gonna focus on at all right now or ever. And so, so it really is about um, dividing your world into what's relevant and what's not, what's possible and what's impossible, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And that's a key part of your marketing strategy. Um, no marketing strategy, having no marketing strategy is basically, it's basically going on a walk without any idea of where you're going. You're going to go down the path, you're going to go over the horizon, and you don't know where your destination is. You have no clue about how you're going to get there, how long it's going to take, how much effort it's going to involve, and that's going to kill your, it's going to kill your marketing budget, it's going to kill your enthusiasm and belief in marketing, and then like a lot of companies, they'll give up on marketing because they, they don't believe it's going to generate ROI and it's not, it's not doing. And if you're doing that, then you're essentially operating with one hand tied behind your back. You're not going to be successful and marketing is not going to support your success. Um, the different marketing strategic elements include people, obviously your people, the people that you need to drive your marketing forward. And that could be internal or external, obviously your customers, your product, which is the center of everything. Um, there was a question on LinkedIn recently about whether you would have a good product and bad marketing or a bad product and good marketing. It's always a good question. And I'm solely in the camp of a good product and bad marketing. If I had to pick because you can't put lipstick on a pig, you could have amazing marketing, but if your product is not good, doesn't deliver value, doesn't meet a problem, that it doesn't matter how good your marketing is, people will find you out. Eventually they will discover that you're not offering any value and you're not, um, you're not solving a problem. Uh, the other part is obviously the competitive landscape. Uh, you know, what are you doing versus the com competition? How can you outflank the competition by doing marketing better or differently? And the final element is money. Uh, for a lot of smaller companies, money is, is a challenge because you don't have much of it. So you have to get creative and there's a lot of do it yourself going on. And for larger companies, it's about how do we allocate our money in the best way. Um, David Ogilvy, who was a very well-known advertising executive in the 1960s and 70s said, great marketing only makes a bad product fail faster. And that sort of, um, sort of emphasizes the point that I was making about marketing is that essentially at the end of the day, you want to have a product that delivers value. Marketing is only as good as the product. Doesn't matter good how good your salespeople are or your marketing people, it's all about product and all about delivering value. So why marketing? That's one of the key questions that you have to think about when you're putting together a marketing strategy. What do you wanna get out of marketing? When I, when I talk to prospects who say, we wanna do marketing, it's like, well, like, why? Like, what is prompting this sudden interest in marketing? Do you wanna grow? Is there competitive threats you want to deal with? So there's lots of different things you need to think about. One of them is really having a commitment to marketing. So marketing isn't one of these things where you can operate in fits and starts. You can't do marketing and then hit the pause button and then hit marketing again. It can't be one of these fast and furious activities and then you, you go quiet for a while. Marketing is a marathon, not a sprint. It's something that you've got to do consistently. You've got to move the ball forward every single day. You've got to leverage different tools and different channels and that you've constantly got to be engaging, creating content, operate, um, launching campaigns and have a constant presence. And so when you're thinking about marketing and developing a marketing strategy, you have to ask yourself, are we ready for marketing? Are we ready to make a commitment in terms of time, money and people? And if the answer is yes, then go ahead and create a marketing strategy. 
So the place where you start with a marketing strategy is establishing your goals. So what is it that you want to achieve through marketing? And that can be anything. It can be brand awareness, demo requests, media coverage, more customers, more leads. You want to, you want to attract better employees. You want to drive SEO. You want to attract more speaking opportunities. Whatever you want to do, you should clearly articulate what your goals are. So what are your goals for the next six months, one year, two years? And those will be, as they say in the industry, those will be your North Stars. Those are the things that will guide you as you move forward with your marketing activities. And so it's like having a uh, end destination. Like if you don't know where you're going, then it doesn't really matter. So you want to know where you're going and marketing strategy helps you figure out how to get there. So that's, that's the most important thing when you start a marketing strategy. Um, the other thing, and this is, this is a very well-known concept within the marketing world is smart. So you want, when it comes to your goals, you want to figure out, be specific about what you want to do. You want ways to quantify and measure your marketing activities. You want them to be attainable. And by attainable, it's being realistic about what you can, can do based on your budget, and your people and and how big your marketplace is because you could have goals to be a unicorn but you may not have the people or the budget to make that happen from a marketing perspective um, your goals need to be relevant and you have and it has to be timely and all these elements are part and parcel of putting together a, a strategic plan that makes sense for you and your business and your people so you can have an amazing ambitions, but if you can't pull it off in terms of having the time, money, or people, then you're, you're pretty much wasting your time because it's not realistic. It's not attainable. The other thing about uh, marketing strategy, and this is a, like a goal, and we've talked about this in an earlier webinar about brand position, is having a story. So what is the story that you're going to tell that is going to underpin your marketing strategy? What are the things that you're going to leverage uh, on your different marketing channels? the message, the brand positioning that's going to capture people's attention, whether they're reading a blog, they're on a video, they're on a webinar, they're on social media. So you have to discover your positioning and how you're different. And the key elements are, how is your product different or unique? And these are things you need to think about when you're telling your story. What do customers like about your product? What problems are you solving? We talked about it right off the get-go. Um, you need to be very clear about the problem that you're solving and why it matters to customers. And what do your customers talk about on social media, forms and with customer service? That'll help you with your story. And what's the com competition's positioning? What do they talk about? What are the things that they say that, that, that they're better at that they do? And how do you outflank the competition or do, do, do things better? So value propositions, I could go, I could talk for lots and lots of time about value propositions, but you need to create a value proposition to underpin your marketing and your marketing strategies. And so in this case, it's who are you serving? What do they need? What, are their, what do they want? And how does your product deliver on those needs or problems? So in my case, it's for B2B companies, that's my target audience. What do they want? They want to attract and engage better prospects. And what do I do? So Marketing Spark is a fractional CMO with expertise in brand positioning, messaging, strategic planning, and tactical execution. Very clear, very concise. So there's no ambiguity about what you do. And this type of um, messaging can go on your website, on your presentations, on your, your profiles, across the board. So a marketing strategy is only as good as the story you're going to tell. So it doesn't matter what channels you pick. You have to have a story to underpin it. Um, brand position is also important. Brand position is an internal exercise. Um, so you identify some of the key things that you need to focus on to develop brand position. And brand position really is um, identify, it's almost like a brand value proposition, but what you wanna do with a brand positioning is you wanna identify the last part, unlike the competition, our product is. And this is your opportunity to really be clear about why you're better, different, um, you know, cheaper, faster, however you want to differentiate yourself, that's the key to a brand positioning. So again, your story really, the two key things with your story are value propositions and brand positioning. And then you can move forward with a marketing strategy because you know the story you're going to tell on different channels. 
The other thing that we've talked about before in the past is target audiences. And, and I, I talk about this a lot because one of the things that I really found interesting on LinkedIn recently is there's a number of marketers who are talking about the value of knowing your customers, the importance of being customer centric. And what it says to me is that too many companies have no clue about their customers. They, in fact, they take their customers for granted. They're so focused on product. We have this great product. It's for, it solves this problem and people should buy it, but they don't know their target audiences. They, they don't talk to them. They haven't got any hypothesis about who they are, what their interests, their buying behavior, um, their priorities, their pains, their problems. So you need to, need to have a crystal clear idea about your target audience so that, so that you have a strategic plan that makes sense. So whatever you do is going to be more successful because it's focused on the right people in the right channels. So um, buyer personas are, so this is basically sort of the covers the different options. You know, what are their needs and pains and interests? What are their purchase triggers? How do they research and make decisions? What are the competitive options? Some pretty fundamentals. So buyer persona can look like this. So this is pretty straightforward. So this is a very in-depth look at the people that matter to you. So my suggestion is you have two or three buyer personas. So for example, if you're selling, let's say, um, cosmetics to women. So there are women who are uh, 25 to 35. And they are working in a, in a particular environment. Their needs are the same as someone who's 35 to 45, but maybe the type of products they buy are different. Maybe the use cases are different because maybe older consumers aren't as social or they don't, they don't need it for different kinds of things, but you really need to sort of slice and dice your audience. So it's not one big amorphous group. They all don't look the same, act the same, have the same needs. There's often variations on a theme. So you have to look at your buyer personas in that respect. The other thing that's important is to buy, is to look at the different types of buyers that you have or different types of people within the, uh, the buying process. So that, for example, you've got people who are initiators and I call these the hunter and gatherers. These are people who work for innovation teams or they're, they're junior marketers and their jobs are to find the best solutions for the problems and they'll bubble up those solutions to their boss and then who bubbles it up to the their boss you've got users people who are actually using your product they're not the buyers or decision makers they're the people at the end of the food chain who are you're solving their problems so you have to be very aware about how you can market to them there are the influencers the people who are who can bring your product into the spotlight who are who have an impact in terms of the type of things that should be looked at and then you've got decision makers the people who cut the checks, the people at the end of the day don't need to know everything about your product. They don't need to have in-depth knowledge about the problems that you solve, but because a lot of that will be, work, be done by the decision, by the influencers and the users or the initiators, but you do need to provide them with a really high level view about what you do and why you matter. So there's different ways to slice and dice your target audiences, but the, the key thing is that uh, you want to basically have different types of stories for different target audiences so that you can engage them in different ways. And they will use different marketing channels and that's all part of a marketing, a marketing strategy. The buyer's journey, um, you should be aware of the buyer's journey. There's it's divided in different stages. So awareness is when they're looking at different options, they're learning about the different products out there, different possible solutions. The consideration stage is okay. They've narrowed down the number of options. They've, it's you and two or three other companies. And the decision stage is obviously when they're really trying to figure out what makes sense to them. So from a marketing strategy point of view, it comes down to at the awareness stage, it's social media, blogs, videos, as people get more serious about your product, um, a strategic approach could involve white papers, sales sheets, case studies. And as they get into the design stage, it's really about trials, demos, consultation proposals. So, different marketing tactics at different times, all within a marketing strategy so that you're not telling the same story or using the same channels across the board. Some channels will be more effective at awareness, for example, and others will be more effective at the decision stage. So all those things need to be part of a marketing strategy. So you know who you're marketing to, when it needs to happen, 
and the, the type of channels that you need to leverage to be successful and to move your prospects down the sales funnel. So let's talk channels. There are, marketing is obviously, there's a buffet. It's, it's an endless choice of what you could do and what the different options that you could embrace. And as, um, as Michael Porter said off the top, the, the most important thing is to figure out what you should do and what you shouldn't do. So within uh, the marketing world, and it's important to remember that marketing is more than just digital. There is print, there's radio, there's TV, there's direct mail. I have a client, for example, that is using postcards to engage with prospects. And you're probably saying to yourself, postcards, why would anybody send a postcard out? And the fact of the matter is, is that, is that direct mail works and that when everybody is using the same digital marketing tools, we're all over social media and LinkedIn and content marketing, is that sometimes a good marketing strategy is about, is it going against the grain? You know, doing things that others aren't doing so that if everybody's on the content marketing bandwagon, maybe you should be doing something different because you can get lost in the crowd unless you're really good at content marketing. Uh, it's, it's hard to um, differentiate yourself. And one of the things that I think about a lot these days is podcasting and how much interest there is in launching a podcast. Now, to put things in context, five years ago, podcasts were red hot and then they disappeared. And what happened a couple of years ago was that a number of brands, particularly B2B brands, started to realize that there was an opportunity to do something that a lot of other brands weren't doing. So they started to embrace podcasts. They got ahead of the curve. They started to see results, but they were doing something that at the time was seen as somewhat different. People were saying, well, why are you using podcasts? Because no one's using podcasts these days. And all of a sudden the rest of the world caught up to them, but they're way ahead of the pack. So it's okay to think out of the box. It's okay to do things that other companies aren't doing. It doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. It just means you're taking a different approach. And I think that's one of the important things about a marketing strategy is that do things that matter to you, do things that are relevant to your business. And sometimes a marketing strategy involves experimentation and an element of risk. And that's okay. Uh, because I always say that marketing is a bit of a, is a hypothesis. You're actually putting together something that you think is going to work until you actually do it. You're not actually sure that you're doing the right things um, at the right time. So one thing I want to talk to you in terms of marketing, and I apologize for the spelling mistake, that's inexcusable for a, for a content marketer, is, is going back to an earlier point about not trying to be all things to all people. And I always say that you should dance where the party's happening. And what I mean by that is that, is that when you look at your target audiences and you create buyer personas and you get a very good idea of where your prospects are learning, engaging, um, um, whether they're being um, motivated or encouraged, you, you have to pick the channels that are most relevant to your prospects. And so if they're not on Facebook, then you can ignore the fact that Facebook has a million plus users. If they're not on LinkedIn, ignore the fact that LinkedIn has 600 million plus users. You need to dance where they dance. So if, if they're all over Reddit for whatever reason, then you should be on Reddit. If they're into videos and they're not into blogs, then be all over videos. Put all your resources in the videos. Do not waste your time, especially when you're early stage, doing things that aren't as relevant and aren't as important to your target audiences. Because, and it goes back to your customers, it's all about them. It's not about you. I mean, really, it's, it's about what their needs are, what their interests are. Um, and you need to be where they are. You need to engage where they're engaging, where they're learning. So that's rule number one. And a related point is to avoid the shotgun approach to marketing. So it's so easy to think that if we do 10 different things, one of them's going to work. Somehow we're going to throw spaghetti against the wall and something's going to stick. And that's what we're going to rally around. Well, by the time you get to that point, you've done a lot of things in a very mediocre way and you haven't engaged your audience. You haven't uh, educated or entertained or encouraged, and people are going to lose interest in you. You're whatever you do is not going to resonate and your competition who's going to be far more focused is going to be far more successful and you're going to be left behind. So avoid the shotgun approach. It's, it's, as we'll say, as I've mentioned later, less is 
often and in many cases more. The less you do, the more successful that you'll be. So I want to um, talk about something what I call the LRP system. And, it's, and there's lots of different uh, sort of methodologies out there um, that talk about this kind of approach. But this is really about, about list, uh, rank, and prioritize. And that's why I asked you off the, off the top to pick one channel that either you're using right now or that you're thinking about using. And this system will help you figure out whether it makes sense for you. So step number one um, in, in this system is to list everything within your marketing ecosystem and, and anything that could be relevant. So it doesn't matter whether it's super relevant. So for example, if you're a B2B company and content marketing is like super relevant, well, that's at your list, but it could be something that maybe could be applicable to serve your target audiences. So for example, it could be uh, a podcast or a newsletter. At this point, list everything. And it could be 10 things or 15 things or five things, whatever, whatever matters to you. So just list them. Um, down in, in a box. The next step is then rank your channel. So on the left side, side left hand side of this, of this tool, you put all the marketing channels that you listed in step one, and then you want to rank them. So for example, if you picked, in my case, if you pick blogging as your, um, as the channel that you're using or you want to explore. So you got to figure number, number one cost. So you rank it from one to five. So one being expensive and five being inexpensive. So let's say you're a startup and you're going to do your own blogging. You would put that as a four or a five. It's going to be very cheap or sort of cheap. Okay. So that's number one. Second would be effort. So is it hard to do or easy to do? So for blogging, in my example, I've said, well, it's probably in the middle somewhere. It's not hard, it's not easy, so I'll give it a three. So you've got, you've got, you've got a, fa a four for cost, a three for effort. And what's the ROI on blogging? So if you're a startup and you say to yourself, well, blogging is gonna drive brand awareness, it's gonna educate our customers, it's going to allow us to profile our, our product and the problem that it solves. So I'm gonna say the ROI is, is a four, it's relatively high. So you add all those scores together, and in this case, you get 11 out of 15. So from a quick and easy perspective, you can say to yourself, blogging may make a lot of sense as part of my overall marketing strategy. And you can apply this methodology to all your marketing channels. So at the extreme, you could look at a newsletter and you could say, okay, the cost would be a three, the effort would be a three and the ROI would be a one which is a seven. So you could say to yourself, well, maybe that's not as good an option because it doesn't score as high. So the, the next step for you is to list all your marketing options and rank everything. And this could be something that you do right now to assess your current marketing activity. And it's a tool that you could look at if you're exploring some new options. So if LinkedIn, for example, is something that you're excited about and, and something that you should be excited about, then apply these uh, this criteria to LinkedIn and anything else. So that's, that's the thing. So after you score everything, um, after you've ranked everything and, and got a sense of what channels are where, then you prioritize your channels into what I call now, soon, and later. So now are the things that you've got to do right now. These are the things that are going to move the ball, move the uh, ball or move the needle. And it could be two or three things soon are things that maybe you should do in the next three to six months, three to nine months, because at some point in time, you'll have more uh, marketing resources, you'll have more money, you'll have more people, and you can take on more. Um, or the other alternative is maybe the first things you picked, you can double down on those things because they're so successful and you can leverage them in so many different ways that you never need to move to the soon list. And later are things that have a low score, a low ROI, you may, Maybe you'll get to them one day, maybe you'll launch a newsletter or you'll never get to them. And that's the one thing about a marketing strategy, uh, going back to what Michael Porter said, is that there's things that you'll never have to do. There's things that you'll never have to consider. They'll never be part of the marketing mix. They, they don't matter to you and they don't matter to your customers. And that's okay. Because not being all things to all people is a perfectly good way of doing business. And, and going back to my earlier point is less is more. Or if you want to think about it more, 
or less, right? So the idea is that, that if you are successful, focused on a small number of marketing channels, those are the things that drive your marketing strategy, then that is completely fine. Just make sure that you're doing whatever you're doing as, as effectively and as, 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 um, as productively as possible, that you're engaging your target audiences, you're educating them, you're encouraging them, you're getting them to do what you want them to do to achieve your overall goals. And the final piece um, is, is tactical execution. And it really, I mean, it really breaks down into, and this is sort of where you rubber hits the road, right? So there's, it's just a matter of doing the marketing, but it really breaks down into a sort of a key, a few key pieces here, which are part of our marketing strategy, which you need to articulate so that you've got a, a playbook uh, by which anybody can understand how you do marketing, why you do marketing, how marketing works. And it comes, breaks down to what are you going to do? So a marketing strategy really needs to spell out what are the channels that you're going to use? Who's going to do it? So is it going to be something internal? And are you going to have someone specifically assigned to do that task, be it a blog or videos or infographics? Or are you going to use a third party? Are you going to use a freelancer, a consultant, an agency? Um, how to do it? Like, what are best practices? What are the steps that you need to take to do something as effectively as possible? So if you're on, on Instagram, what are the different steps you need to take to create content, publish content, share content, engage with your tar target audiences, grow your list? So all those steps need to be spelled out. How often are you going to do it? Once a week? once a month, once a quarter. So those are all part of the mix. How do you measure success? Um, you've got to know, you got to quantify where you're doing so that you can decide whether you're being successful or not, whether you need to reload on your marketing strategy or whether you need to double down whatever you're doing. And then what are the tools you're going to use? Like how are you going to make your marketing as efficient and successful as possible? And the final piece is measurement. And as Winston Churchill said, however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. And so whether you've got particular KPIs or benchmarks or, me or metrics that you're using, um, you've, got to, you've got to assess whether you're being successful. And, and as they say, measure, 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 measure. For digital marketing, measure, 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 measure. And you reload uh, if it's not working. Double down if what you're doing is totally effective and expand your horizons if you're feeling ambitious, if you've got more money. And, the one thing I want to stress in a data-driven, metrics-driven world is that yes, everything can be measured, most things can be measured, but simply because something can't be measured or it's difficult to measure doesn't mean that it doesn't matter, right? So going back to the importance of messaging and brand positioning and having a marketing strategy, it's sometimes it's hard to measure the effectiveness of really good messaging or a really effective strategy when you're putting things together. Because how do you quantify messaging until you get out there? How do you quantify the successful marketing strategy until you realize how your marketing is actually working? And in some respects, when it comes to these kind of things, marketing is a leap of faith. It's a matter of, of having the confidence that you're doing the right things and that it's going to resonate and matter to your target audiences. And you will find out in time whether these marketing efforts worked or not. But it, but it shouldn't stop you from investing in these type of activities. So I've covered a lot of ground. There are a couple of options. I'm going to share the presentation on, with Craig and he'll share it with you. If you've got questions, you can ask now or you can approach me directly via email. I'm happy to spend the time to answer any, any of your questions. And um, yeah, and this is how you can get in contact with me. Um, Happy to talk to you about marketing strategy and tactics, uh, brand positioning and, uh, and strategy. Um, again, if you've got questions, ask them on the chat or you can ask them directly, but, uh, but thanks for your time. Hope I've given you some, some insight into the different parts of, of a marketing strategy and what you need to create one. And, and I said, if you haven't got a marketing strategy right now, then step one would be to create a marketing strategy. Yeah, Mark, you mentioned, you know, dancing where the party is, which is um, often overlooked um, aspect. You know, people say, should I be on Facebook? Should I be on LinkedIn? Should I be on Instagram? And I get these kinds of questions all the time. And 
the the answer is maybe <laughs> depending on you, you know your individual group is there um, when people are doing their research is there rules of thumb of around which social media channels they should um, engage in or are there tools you use to find out where their audience is well i mean part of it is, is putting you your buyer personas whether it comes back to knowing your target audiences and and what do they do to educate themselves how do they make decisions what what marketing channels are they using? So as, as you get into your buyer personas, you can recognize the fact that, that people in your um, world are on Facebook. That's where they, that they use Facebook extensively. That's where they spend a lot of time. So you should create content on Facebook and advertise on Facebook. It's just that insight into how your, into how your customer engages with your industry, with your, the type of products that, that you're developing. Um, and, and really sort of making some sort of very straightforward decisions on, on what they're doing and what they're not doing. I mean, for early stage companies, you know, you're really sort of making educated guesses because you may not have a lot of insight into your customers, but, um, but it's important to sort of um, have a general idea about where your audiences are and then focus on those channels. Yeah, I find some of them, some of them are obvious, but some of them aren't. Um, I've done work with trying to do some of this stuff with clients and it's interesting when we look at it and we take a deep dive that things like Telegram or things like uh, WhatsApp are driving a lot of competitor traffic and you're at the end, you're, they're not in it at all. Like these are the diamonds in the rough that people don't necessarily consider right away. Uh, you mentioned Reddit. Um, things like Quora. Are your, are your customers asking questions on Quora? Are there other places that you would suggest people look? There's, I mean, the marketing landscape is huge. And, and one of the things that, one of the, the channels that re is really interesting right now is TikTok. I mean, TikTok is in the news for all kinds of, all kinds of different reasons these days. But when you look at TikTok from a B2B perspective, your first sort of reaction is, I'm not going to be on there. Why would I want to be on TikTok? But then when you drill down and you assess the opportunities, it may make sense to allocate Part of your marketing, but part of your marketing budget or your resources on TikTok to experiment. Like I said, marketing is experiments. Like as much as you can sort of say, okay, our audience is on LinkedIn. That's where we need to be. It doesn't mean that you, you, you can't dabble and have a little skunk works project on the side um, to drive your marketing forward. I noticed in the chat there's a question about KPI yep. development, and and you know, KPIs can be MQLs, and and I could go on about the value of MQLs these days. They could be the number of leads, the number of, of demo requests, the number of conversations you're having, the number of page views. Like you shouldn't really overcomplicate, especially for early stage. I mean, I'm, the data people are probably gonna get mad at me, but you shouldn't really overcomplicate your KPIs. Like what are the metrics that matter to your business? Is it the number of website visitors? Is it the number of, of demo requests? Is it the number of conversations you're actually having with customers? And I think that's the most important uh, KPI of all these days, especially for B2B companies, but pick the things that you think are important and then, and then, and then measure against those. And as your marketing gets more sophisticated, then you can look at things like, you know, cost of acquisition and lifetime cost of your customer. Um, but don't get too hung up on, on the metrics because because you just focus on what's important to you right now and to your business. Like if you're early stage, it's all about how many leads are we having? How many, how much website traffic are we getting? How many, how much engagement in social media is happening? Those are the things that are relevant to you. And are there, um, you know, some best practices, uh, KPIs, um, you know, a lot of people don't know where to start. I like to start at looking at where your bottlenecks are as a startup, but is there uh, another place to start? I would say that if you're like, in terms of like, like a fundamental, get yourself started on Google Analytics and really sort of get a real sense of, of how Google Analytics works and how you can um, set up goals within Google Analytics and really get some real sort of fundamental information about what's going on as far as your different marketing channels. Uh, that's what I would say in terms of just a, a very um, straightforward tool. Um, there's lots of different tools out there to measurement, but I mean, the, your analytics are the place to start. Um, I noticed on the, on the yeah. sorry, go ahead, Greg. Sorry. Yeah, we have another uh, question here about uh, print media, and I'm going to just, you know, they say, do flyers really work? I'm just going to mention print media as a whole. Uh, uh, you know, 
honestly, junk mail, this is going on with the question, can be so overwhelming. And I know for myself, I don't even uh, read it. Uh, they go straight to the trash. So one, does print media, flyers, that type of thing, postcards, like you mentioned, actually work? And two, how do you avoid getting tossed in the trash right away? So direct mail is, is still very much alive and well, and the response rates for direct mail are probably more impressive than you think. So they range in sort of the one to 2% range. So it does demonstrate for particular types of businesses, direct mail works. Now it comes down to a couple of things. One is uh, being very targeted about the people that you're sending direct mail to. So you can buy lists um, based on different criteria. So if you're just trying to shotgun approach to direct mail, it's not going to work. But if you can if you can target based on on area codes, for example, or zip codes, then you're going to be targeting particular groups of people. So, for example, if you're you've got a um, a food delivery service, then direct mail campaigns to the downtown core in Toronto are probably going to be more successful than than direct mail to the suburbs. So that's a fundamental. The other thing when it comes to direct mail is is being creative, is the sense that Creating direct mail doesn't look like every single piece of direct mail out there. And that's a marketing fundamental. So you really want to differentiate yourself. You want to do things that are going to capture people's attentions. But I would say for some businesses, direct mail makes complete sense right now. It can be a very cost effective way to drive your marketing forward. And, and in terms of how you would measure direct mail, there's QR codes, there's, um, there's bespoke uh, URLs. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can tell the type of engagement you're getting from your direct mail campaigns. A lot of people ask me or, or you know, want to start a podcast. You mentioned podcasts um, already, uh, you know, and I mentioned that uh, to people as well. But it's a lot of work and people either start and stop or they don't start. Um, so how do you evaluate, you know, honestly, that effort part of the chart exercise we went through? Because, you know, there's always effort in all marketing strategies and people sometimes will underestimate one or overestimate their another. Is there a way to take bias out of that? Podcasts are extremely exciting place to be right now. So I launched a podcast after thinking about it for, well, after not thinking about it, after especially dismissing a podcast for about a year. I finally jumped on the bandwagon a couple months ago. My podcast is called Marketing Spark and it's, it's 15 minute conversations with marketers in the trenches. And the reason that podcasts are so compelling and I think that the reason why they, they're just a no brainer these days is they, they give you access to thought leaders and expertise. So I can reach out to lots of different people and ask them to appear on my podcast. And what they're gonna give me is, is evergreen content evergreen information. So I can not only create a great podcast, but I can use that content to create really good blog posts and eBooks and infographics and social media snippets. So you, it's one of these things where you, where you create it once and you reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. And as far as the effort's concerned, I don't think people should be afraid of producing a podcast. Everyone thinks that you, know, you listen to some of these you know, Joe Rogan or some of these really popular podcasts and you think to yourself, oh my God, they've got to be super well produced and slick and they've got to sound great. Well, no, they don't. You can essentially start a podcast with minimal investment and the biggest investment you're going to make is time. Like you really have to um, put the time in, but it all comes down to what's realistic. So if you want to do a weekly podcast or a bi-weekly podcast and you, you're committed, then the, the steps are going to be pretty straightforward. I'm going to actually publish an ebook in a couple of weeks and I'll let Craig know about it, about how to start a podcast from scratch. But listen, if you're interested in podcasting, if you've got an itch for podcasting, then, then you should go for it right away. And if you want to email me about, about how to start a podcast, I'd be happy to talk to you. I have become a podcast evangelist overnight. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I, I would just go for it because it may be like using the criteria, you may have a hard time assessing, should I do a podcast or not? But, but, it's uh, the ROI is huge for all kinds of different reasons. Yeah. One of the main things I look at is SEO for lack of nothing else. You know, when you do a podcast and you publish it to SoundCloud and Apple and Google and Spotify and you know, all the other ones I don't can't think of off the top of my head. Uh, usually if you do show notes, those are all backlinks to your site. And usually with every uh, podcast I do, 
um, the ones uh, Toronto Start Startup Talk, we uh, we have several backlinks in, in each of our show notes for different things. And so every time you produce a podcast, you're getting 20 or 30 high quality backlinks from high quality uh, sites. So that alone is of value. Never mind the actual content, the people who listen, the engagement that you get, and hopefully, you know, as you're starting to warm up your the relationships, people, you're start uh, starting to build that trust um, through podcasting. Yeah, I mean, uh, podcasting is great for all kinds of different reasons. SEO is one of them. Brand awareness, uh, building a brand personality, delivering value. You know, and, and and one of the other things to think about from a podcast is it actually gives you permission to reach out to your prospects and ask them if they want to be on your podcast. It's it's classic soft selling. You're you're engaging with them and offering them a compelling opportunity, but you're not selling, sort of, kind of. So, yeah, absolutely. This is one of the things I recommend all the time. Start a podcast, start a conference, start a panel, uh, anything where you can invite people to be take part. Yeah, great. Great question. Yeah, I'm all over uh, it. You mentioned ebooks. Now, the problem I've seen a lot of people uh, is that they think an ebook needs to be, you know, 500 pages or maybe like three pages. There's no happy medium. And they're. Uh, let's say psychologically blocked and don't necessarily understand the effort of an ebook. Since you're about to launch one, are you have any tips on that? Um, how long does it take? Should you just outsource uh, the writing of an ebook? So to me, an ebook is about a thousand to fifteen hundred words, and it is wrapped in really nice design. So people don't read anymore; they scan. Uh, you do not want an ebook to look like a lot of work. You want it to make. You want it to be like accessible, user-friendly, um, make it look like, and, and at the same time, you want to offer value. You want to deliver something that's not about your product, not about your brand, but is about your customer's problems and how you can give them insight so they can be more successful. So that's, that's step number one. To create an ebook, you can do it yourself or you could hire someone. It probably costs you probably a thousand to $1,500 to hire, hire a good writer to write an ebook, but to make the job easier, you should, Brainstorm an idea, and then you should map out that idea. You should, you should create an outline about the, the introduction, the key points you want to make. So it could be three or four key points, and then your conclusion. So each section, in a very simplistic way, could be 200 to 300 words. A 200-word introduction, point number one, 250 words. Point number two, 250 words. And that way, you're actually, if you build a very detailed outline, you've almost got the, the ebook half written. And then... The other thing is when you're writing an ebook, you have to decide how you're going to distribute it. And there are two schools of thought right now. One is to gate it. So if the ebook has value and you want to use it to drive uh, your email database, then you ask someone to uh, give you their email. And that can be a very good way of building out your email list, being able to engage with people who you think are prospects and that necessarily need to be a prospect. Or the other school of thought, and one that's gaining a lot of ground, especially in B2B, is to ungate it, is to essentially just launch it and to make it a, available to as many people as possible. Like why, why like restrict the number of people who can engage with your content and your brand by making them give you an email address? So you have to decide what's more important to you, whether it's that email address that you need to drive your, your marketing automation or whether you just simply want to share something with the world uh, to to uh to drive brand awareness from for my podcast uh ebook that i'm going to launch i'm going to make it free I, I i don't need your email address i mean i i don't really want to drip you i don't need to drip you what i want you to do is be aware of the of the, the value that i'm offering so that when you're considering a your marker maybe you'll consider me so but i i do not get hung up in in the effort for an ebook because they do not need to be terribly long they just need to offer value you talked about measurement, and this is something I think is key to all startups. Whenever you're doing anything, you know, you're doing any effort for a result and measuring against that to see if, you know, you're meeting those results or you need to tweak or what needs to happen. Uh, how often do you measure these channels? Because we talked about level of effort and uh, um, potential gains and stuff, but, it, you know, I do 10 podcasts. I'm not getting what I want. Do I stop? Does it have to be 20? Same thing with blogging. You know, what, what is when, um, how often do you measure and when do you drop something? So I said, 
at one point that marketing is a, it's, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So, so a lot of marketing activity takes time to resonate. Like you can't expect a blog to be an overnight success story. The same goes for a podcast. So you have to give it a certain amount of time and you have to be committed and you have to execute as well as possible. And maybe you give it three to six months to see if it's working. I mean, some things you can quantify fairly quickly and you should, and you should look on a regular basis, either if it's not daily, then every other day or every week to see how your marketing is performing, to see whether it makes sense. And some things just need time to percolate. They, you just have to allow them to evolve as they should. So a podcast, for example, it may not be about the number of subscribers. It may just be an activity that generates so much good content for other things to drive your blog or your eBooks that you don't need to see amazing success from a podcast. It's just a, a key part of your marketing engine. Some are more easily quantifiable and some others, but, it, but to your point, Craig, if something's not working, if you're writing a blog and it's not working, then you got, then you got, you've got a problem. Either that your blog posts aren't being, they're not relevant. They're not interesting. They're not on point. You're not promoting them properly or your audience isn't into blogging. They're just not something that they're using to learn about your product. So it may be to take a different approach or you just drop blogging and you focus on a podcast. Um, but those are decisions that, yeah, you've got to make along the way. And uh, thank you very much for taking the time today. Uh, any parting words for our audience? The only thing I can tell you is that if you're not operating without a marketing strategy, if even if it's a one page marketing strategy that lists the things that really matter to you, then you're operating blind and that your marketing cannot be successful. And if you're not successful, then you'll get discouraged by marketing. And the last thing I want anybody to do is not feel that marketing is not a key part of, the, of, of their market, of their business DNA. It has to be like, I always say that when it comes to the pillars of your business, it's product, sales, marketing, and customer service. And you've got to have all four if you don't have one of them, then your, your business is not going to, not going to be as successful as it, as it should be. So, so have a plan, uh, execute against the plan, measure the plan and, and then go from there. Final parting words. And if people, I know it's on the screen here, but uh, just in case people are listening and not watching, where can they find out more? Uh, they can check out my website at marketingspark.co. Thank you again, Mark. Thank you for the questions and the audience and taking your time on uh, your lunchtime today. Appreciate it. And we'll see you all uh, maybe tomorrow or if not next week.